Welcome to another episode of the Loadout Music Podcast, featuring in-depth interviews with a wide range of music personalities, from Rock and Roll Hall of Famers to Grammy winners and today's rising stars. Recorded from the old rock house in St. Louis, Missouri, here's your host, Aaron Perlutt. Welcome back to the Loadout Music Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Aaron Perlutt. Today, we are joined by singer-songwriters Diane Gentile and Alejandro Escovedo. They have a beautiful new duet out called Walk With Me that will be on a forthcoming album from Diane and the Gentlemen due out in September. Diane, Alejandro, welcome to the show. Thanks, Thanks. Aaron. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. So, um, you know, I know you you both have a, a, a long history in music, in working in the music industry, and you both come from families that are very musical, having siblings that play music. But how did how did the two of you hook up? Alejandro, was it from your time when you lived in New York back in the late 70s, or did you was it something completely different? We must have brushed shoulders at that time, but uh no, we did not meet then. I, I met Diane when I began to play the Bowery Electric and through Jesse Mallon. Um and that's when I first met Diane. And, you know, when I first met her, I thought, well, here's this really wonderful person, a great, cool lady. And I thought she was cool, you know, and I just always would love having conversations with her. And when she would book the gigs and we put on a lot of great shows, she helped me put together shows. Uh, when I did my residency in New York, Diane, do you remember that? And I do, I do, that was amazing. Yeah, we played the Bowery Electric, we played Berlin, uh, Coney Island Baby, and I think one other, or maybe we played Bowery twice, I'm not sure. But we had four shows during that time. They were all different thematic shows. Uh, one was with Lenny Kay, where we did all of Nuggets kind of thing. Uh, we did uh, one with Sylvain. Do you remember that show we did? Yeah, that? Oh, yeah, that was... That was killer. It was so great. Yeah. So anyway, Diane has been, you know, very, very involved in the shows that I've done in New York when it pertains to those venues. And I really fell in love with her as a person. And then I suddenly discovered that she sang and wrote songs. And when that happened, I must tell you that I was very, very surprised that she wasn't out you know, touring, headlining shows, getting added to bills that she deserved to be on, you know, Thank in my you. opinion, <laughs> no, no, it's cool. But, you know, in my opinion, she was, you know, well above the grade that a lot of people who were out touring and playing, I thought she was way better than that, let's say. Her songs were great. She sang great. She had a great presence, great image. Um, she had great bands. Um, she had all the elements, you know. Thank so you so much, Alejandro. So why isn't this happening, like on the level that I felt it should? But and I, think I, I told her a couple times, you got to get out there. You got to get out there. You got to get out there. And you know, she she came through Austin once with. Uh, that must have been about four years. It was pre-COVID, wasn't it? It was. It was just pre-COVID yeah, yeah yeah it was like in uh in 2019 right and you know Diane came through with Jesse and she played one of my songs and I got up and sang with her um we did a died a little today right I think it was yeah yes we did and yeah. uh yeah and I was kind of out of it still because I had had that I had had an accident I wasn't feeling so well exactly and, um and uh, Alejandro got up on stage with me and I couldn't believe it. I, I I was just, I was just like, oh my God, this is happening to me because I'm a huge fan of his. Well, when, when Diane went through that accident and she'll tell you, I'll let her tell you about that experience. But, you know, we were all deeply concerned and, uh, you know, freak, freaked me out. And I was just hoping for her to come back. And she came back, you know, in, in, Maybe even better than she was before. You know, Bigger was, and better, yeah, and, yeah. And stronger, more committed to her music and her career as a as a writer and, yeah. a, and a singer, you know. So we did that gig. She came over to the house. We spent a little time together. And then 
you know, continued more and more shows in New York and we'd get together. And then finally, about a year ago, I guess it was maybe, yeah. uh, Diane asked me to sing on this song. And I was, th when I heard the song, I thought, this is a classic, you know, it's like a Ronette song. It's like a Shangri-La song. It's got all the elements of a great female vocal, you know, rock and roll pop song, you know? And, and I mean that in, in, in the most respected terms, you know, it was really on that level. Thank you. And so um, when she asked me to sing, I, I, I jumped at the opportunity. She came out to Austin. We booked a room. Uh, Jim Eno from Spoon has a studio here in uh, uh, West Austin. And we went, uh, she came and stayed with Nancy and I. Uh, we drove to the, to the studio. I actually thought I knew where the house was, where the studio is, and I walked into somebody else's home. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about that. <laughs> and, and, and you don't want to do that in Texas because everyone has a gun, you know, so. <laughs> yes. We're lucky we didn't get shot. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, we did find the studio eventually and uh, had a great day with that producer. Uh, I can't remember his name, but he was amazing. The, the engineer, I should say. And uh, just worked through the song. And when she sent me the track finally, after they had mixed it, and fixed it up the way that they wanted, I was, I fell in love with it. And quite honestly, I can't get that song out of my head since the first time I've heard it as a complete, oh. you know? And uh, it's just become, it, around the house, it's become our favorite song. You know? oh, so, thank you, thank and you. It has, and honestly, it has nothing to do with me singing on it. I mean, I no, love- No, 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 that's not true. <laughs> I, I love that I'm on it, but, uh, you know, you only get those opportunities once in a while to sing on a song like that. I've been asked to sing on a lot of songs with a lot of different people. Um, but the way that she was so generous about the mix, you know, how my voice is pretty prominent in that song, you know, and uh, I think it's a great balance. It's an equal conversation between two people. And it's a lovely sentiment, walk with me, you know, we can laugh or cry you know, um, through these problems that we're having, which a lot of people I think uh, need to hear in these days, you know? So that's my pitch, really. That, that's, that's, the, that's my experience with that song. Diane, that's- well, I'm honored, great. thank uh, you. <laughs> well, so it's interesting in that, Alejandro, you brought up a, you know, some people might not get the casual references, but you mentioned Berlin and Coney Island Baby. Uh, which were obviously, you know, big Lou Reed songs. And Diane, you kind of grew up in the music business, surrounded, uh, growing up in New York, like at a very formative time when, you know, kind of punk scene was taking shape. Uh, and, and I imagine that to this day, that has kind of impacted you as a songwriter and how you've kind of developed as a songwriter over the years. Um, you know... It's interesting because I, I actually wasn't really a big part of that punk scene. My older sister, Elda, played in a band called The Stilettos, but she was much older than me. I mean, she was 10 or 12 years older than me. Um, and so when she was, you know, 20, 19 or 18 playing in The Stilettos, I was only like 11. Um, so I didn't really have, I wasn't really entrenched in that world. But I was so proud of her because she was a singer in New York and she was forging such um, a unique path uh, for women in music and for actually people who who were who who really had open minds and open hearts. You know, she was very pro um, LGBTQ, like she was very pro trans. Um, and she came out and spoke about it. And you're talking about 1969 and 1970. Um, she had no money. She used to make her own clothing. Uh, she sewed clothing. She sewed clothes for the New York Dolls. I mean, she was an all around extremely creative, wonderful human being. So I was really proud to, to, of, of her. But I wasn't you know, I wasn't old enough to really understand all of that stuff. But I do remember 
um, going to college really early. I went to school and um, and I was only 16 uh, when I went to, to college. I had skipped a couple of years of school. And I remember being, I was always the person who was weird. Like nobody, I never really fit in because I played I guitar. <laughs> I played guitar since I was 10. You know, I just, I, you know, I grew up with artists like Collie Simon and the Pretenders and, and, and those wonderful, great women, um, Bonnie Raitt, even, you know, I, I mean, just such a wide variety of great female artists. And, uh, and I admired them. And of course, I was a huge Rolling Stones fan and David Bowie fan. So th those were kind of like those, those artists were my upbringing, but I was really cutting edge because Elda used to, you know, she played me the stilettos and she played me Debbie Harry and she played me Blondie and, and the Ramones and Richard Hell and uh, television and, you know, all of these amazing punk rock bands. And I remember, so funny, I remember being in college, it was my first year, and uh, I call, I used to listen to WNEW radio in New York and they were like the rock station of New York. And I got on the phone and I, one night when I was drinking and I called the radio station at like one o'clock in the morning going, why don't you people play any Richard Hell? Why are you not playing Blondie? Like I was complaining to them at one o'clock in the morning at 16 years old for not playing punk rock, you know? And, it, you know, yeah, so that's my, I mean, I have a very, very wide history. And by the way, Alejandro, I would love for you to come back and play another bunch of shows downtown and let's put together something really cool. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it is funny you you mentioned uh, you know Richard Hell and television. I just I decided to go back and read really one of my favorite books from when I was uh, in high school, uh, Psychotic Reactions and Carburetor Dung by Lester Bangs. And you know he's got a couple chapters that focus on. Um, there actually he's got one that's completely about Richard Hell, and I, I don't think a lot of people understand his contribution to the punk scene. But there were so many interesting acts that were forming what music would become in the '70s. They were well, they were forming what it would become in the '80s, uh, which sounds like that had a, a huge imprint on you. And it's funny you mentioned the Pretenders in that when I first heard the single. Uh, it really had a pretenders kind of vibe to me because it had, uh, you know, it starts off with kind of a nice guitar riff to it. And then it softens as a lot of Chrissy Hines music does as you kind of get into the the verses and then picks back up. And then again, it's a, you know, it's a beautiful duet. And Alejandro, you, you mentioned how generous Diane was in terms of the mix, but I think it's a nice kind of back and forth between as you share verses and then harmonize on the uh, on the choruses. Well, the, the interesting thing about this, though, is like I'm a huge guitar fan freak. So like James Honeyman Scott, you know, was amazing. And um, I currently play with uh, two guitar players that um, I I would bow down and kiss their feet. Uh, James Mastro, who also has who plays with Alejandro Escovedo, um, plays with Ian Hunter. He's he was in a band called the Bongos. He's a super cool, dude. Um, one of the nicest human beings in the world. And I also play, got really lucky, like lucky to be able to play um, with Jason Victor, who plays in a band called the Dream Syndicate. And he also has a new band out now called Skull Practitioners, which are wicked, like wicked, hard rock, progressive, crazy rock and roll. But, you know, I... Um, I'm a real guitar freak. Like I love great guitar players. And so I don't really, like I could never really sit down and just play by myself. Like, I don't like playing by myself. <laughs> I like to play with guitar players. <laughs> Alejandro happens to be a great guitar player. <laughs> why don't, I'm curious, why don't you like playing by yourself? Well, you know, it just gets boring. I like all of those other tones and those other melody lines that people bring to the table. Like a lot of times I hear melodies in my head and I sing them, you know, out to guitar players, but they know how to take them and mold them into something really super extra special. Um, and it just, I don't know, it gets to my soul. I mean, I think Al would probably understand that. I do, although I must say that at this point, I enjoy the 
dramatic silence that comes with solo shows. And I love telling the stories. My shows have become more about the stories than the songs, actually. Um, so in my case, I don't like, I, I always say I hate playing solo because it frightens me to a certain extent. Because you're very naked up there, right? I mean, the guitar parts have to be spot on. The vocal has to be spot on in my, in, in my mind. Um, and so it's a little frightening sometimes. If I'm not in the right head, it can really mess with me, you know? But I've learned that if I unplug and walk into the audience and get close to the audience, it calms me down somehow. So I like getting closer, more intimate with the audience. And I used to joke back when I first started playing solo that I was not aiming to play larger audiences, but smaller audiences because you know, I like the intimacy of a small audience, you know. And I, I never got into this to be a pop star or anything like that. I just wanted to be creative, I guess, you know. Yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. You know, at, at my age, I'm not a young kid and I'm putting out records. Uh, people would look at me and go like, why the hell are you doing that? You know, but when you when you write and you write and you write and you write and you just, you know, do it it's just something that I said, you know, and I'm going to do this, but I, I do love having a guitar player. I like, I like, I like having a band. I like to rock and roll. Like I'm, I don't know. I haven't learned yet how to rock and roll by myself. <laughs> I guess that's what I should say. I, I know that I love, um, I actually prefer rehearsing than I do performing. And it's not because I don't love the crowd. I do love the crowd, but there's something to me magical about, when I write a song and I bring it to the band and at that point, it's just some chords, melody and words. And then as we kind of organically build on that instrument instrumentation and you add layers of whether it's a slide guitar, or just simply a, a lead guitar and, you know, the low end with the bass and the percussion, I find something incredibly magical about that experience as you're building that together as, as a unit. That's true. I mean, you know, that's why bands are so cool because you have, <laughs> you know, the collaboration of four other people and what they bring to it uh, can totally change the complexion of a song, you know. I mean, I come in with just little germs of ideas, you know, but we have built into beautiful pieces of music, you know. Yeah. I mean, Alejandro's vocal on uh, on Walk With Me completely changed. Hey, kitty. <laughs> my, hey, little, my little kitty. Uh, completely changed the vocal on, uh, I mean, it completely changed the feel of the song. And, um, and it was wonderful because his inflection on the chorus actually changed the way I had originally written the song. And it made it so much more meaningful and so much more soulful. And it was just the 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 way he sang a word, you know, that completely changed it. So I wouldn't have had that wonderful experience and the end result of this greatness on this, on the chorus of this song, had it not been for me working with him as a singer, but, you know, that's what collaboration is about. It's, it's, it could be ph phenomenal. You know, the beautiful thing about our collaboration too, I must say, it was so easy, you know, it just fit <laughs> right away. I mean, like everything about it, that her demeanor, my demeanor, uh, her suggestions uh, when we were in the studio vocally were spot on. Um, and it was a joy to do. It's so, I, I can't tell you how easy it, it's, I mean- It was I hate, easy, right? We just went I, to the studio and we sang. <laughs> it, was, it was so simple, it was great. And that, I think that simplicity is hard to find sometimes when you're in the studio because you're under pressure you know, and you expect a lot of yourself. Sometimes you put too much pressure on yourself so that it becomes uptight and not open. The throat has to open, the body has to open, the mind has to open. And that's what I found when we were in the studio. It was just easy, you know, it was great. Yeah, we had a lot of fun that day. That was a fun day. Well, it's kind of like working with a producer that you know just totally gets you. I mean, that's an, such an important aspect of the recording process. I know we're going in the studio in November with a guy named Gregory Dwayne Griffith, who 
he just he gets us he gets our music when he talks about our music i know that he understands what we're trying to accomplish before we even get there and it's such it, it sounds like you had that kind of experience where you just it was just so organic and um like you said alejandro it was easy that's that's and that's a hard thing to do in a collaboration yeah, this this guy Jeff Sanoff also mixed um, that track, and he does um, most of the mixing for Jesse Mallon's records. And I've worked with him now for two of my records, and he is he's just great. He's he's a great mixer. He understands my aesthetic. He understands the rock and roll aesthetic. And when I gave him these tracks, he would he I remember giving him the track and playing it for him in the studio, and he went wow <laughs> he was sitting there he goes wow when Alejandro's vocal came on he was like wow and you could see that he had this genuine love um for the sound of the vocal in the track he goes oh I'm gonna have so much fun with this you know and then he he, he mixed it and sent it to me and I just I mean he got the balance just so perfect you know that I didn't even go back to him and say like oh you have to change this this Jeff you know he just got it right there so when you have the right people that are working uh with a project it it helps a lot yeah that that's the step on mixing I don't people who don't make music I don't think they quite understand the change that goes from pre-mixed to mixed it's to me it's just remarkable like I, I hated our first record before it was mixed and then I heard it mixed I'm like holy shit I love this <laughs> it's uh so um Diane, I know that in, I think it was 2015, you put out the single Motorcycle. And then oh, that- Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm really proud about that song too. Well, and that got really good critical reception. I know uh, Steve Van Zandt, who both of you have a relationship with, kind of praised that song. And then that became part of a, ultimately a, a full album in, I think, 2018. Is yeah, right? it took me a long time to get the, the rest of the record. You know, I don't have a record company that pays for anything and I don't have a studio um, and, and I have to work for a living. So, um, you know, it takes me sometimes a little while to be able to, to get the money that I need to actually go in and do what I really want to do. But it's worth it for me sometimes to have to go through that way to get what I really want from it. Um but Motorcycle was super fun. Uh, you know, Stephen Van Zandt played the hell out of it. And all of the DJs up there on Underground Garage really pounded the track. Um, I was very lucky to get that. Uh, but I really do believe that the song is pretty cool. And I had some friends, you know, I had a friend that pulled together a, a video director on that who came in and, and, and did the video. And there's a kid, his name is Lucas Allen. And... Um, he was actually, I think, 12 years old when he was in that video with me. And about a year ago, I was downtown, I was hanging out. And all of a sudden, this kid walks up to me and he's not a kid anymore. He's like 17 and he's really tall and really skinny. And he's, he's got this great rock and roll hair and he's super dressed like cool rock and roll indie kid. And he comes up to me and he's beautiful. And he says, Diane. And I said, yeah. And he goes, oh, I'm Lucas. And I said, Luke, Lucas. And he goes, yeah, I was in your video, Motorcycle. And this kid is playing music now. And he's selling out like 200 and 300 seats downtown New York, you know, as a musician. And he said to me, I just want you to know that you really influenced me to become a musician. I loved your song, Motorcycle, and it was so meaningful to me. And it's really something that made me move forward in, in, in doing music. And that like gave me such a warm feeling inside, you know, to, to have something motorcycle, be do something like that for somebody, because you don't know how music is going to affect people. I mean, I wrote that as like just a fun summer song. You know, I'm riding on the back of a motorcycle and I'm just going out having a great day. It was like a summer fun song. And 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 then yet again, it created so much for me. Yeah. yeah. It, yeah. Really it, it, it can be such a soul touching experience, whether either you see a live show or you just, you discover a piece of music that just touches you just, just right. It's, uh, yeah. it's amazing. By the way, Stephen Van Zandt actually um, 
they added uh, Walk With Me last week. So we've got Underground Garage too now, in addition to Outlaw Country, um, which are serious uh, radio stations. So we're happy about that. Those are my two my two go-to stations. So uh... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, Alejandro mentioned something earlier and Diane, as someone who's worked as a booker in the industry, I think you 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 acute you are acutely aware of this. Um, and having had to book my own band, which I'd rather stab myself in the eye, uh, I, I am. You, Alejandro, you were talking about how dis, it, I don't, disappointing wasn't the word you used, but but it was a little disappointing in terms of the fact that Diane should have the cachet where she should be out headlining, playing shows, opening up for touring acts. Um, it's hard. I mean, it, it, it's not, it's a, it's hard as a music. There's so many good musicians out there. It's, it's, this is not an easy thing to go build a reputation as an artist and, and get on stages where you're playing for a couple hundred people at a time. But I, I don't see that as being um, anybody's fault, you know, but my own, to be honest with you. I, um, because when you really want something, like when you really want something, you just have to sit down and you have to do the work. And um, the, it is hard, yes, in today's music business, because today's music business, frankly, just sucks. It's not a business for anybody uh, to want to have a career in. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a curse and a blessing, right, I would say. But, um, but you know, like if you, if you can't afford to go out and tour, it makes it really hard. You know, when you're an older artist, I mean, when I was in my twenties, I could have done it. I could have said, you know, the hell with this. I'm not going to have, a, I'm not going to try to get a house and I'm not going to try to get married and I'm not going to try to have a life and just say, I'm just going to do 100% music and throw a backpack on my shoulder and get out there and, and go do it. I mean, I, I, I read books, you know, of other artists. I read, just read the Lucinda Williams book and, you know, how she went about working. I see how Alejandro went out there and worked as an artist. I mean, he gave up everything and worked. I mean, he worked, you know, towards that goal that I didn't do that. You know, I, I did not do that. I was thinking, um, I was afraid to do that. I think I saw um, some people who did try to do that, who failed, who were close to me, and it scared the daylights out of me because I, I, you know, I was worried like, how am I going to make a living? How am I going to live? I don't want to be living in the street. You know, I didn't want to leave New York. New York's really expensive. Um, I don't know. I, you know, I. I I think right now, yeah, I'd love it if I had an agent and a manager and they said, oh, we can get you this support slot and we can get you that support slot and all that. But you know what? It'll come. I'm just going to do the work and it'll come. And and I have to look at life in, in that way. That's, you know, maybe somebody will call me and go, hey, you want to? I mean, I went out with Tommy Stinson last year and we had a, a an amazing tour together. We did 30 days. We went down to the 30A Music Songwriter um festival and we played there but we traveled the whole way down it was right at the end of covid um so that was an interesting uh kind of road to have to map but i don't know if you agree but i i you know no, i i think you're right i mean talk talk a little bit about the um the rest of the record i know it, it's coming out i believe september 15th somewhere around there but uh what's in store for the rest of the record well, I'm having um, uh, a record release party on August 30th. We're playing a big band show at Mercury Lounge and Alejandro is coming up and he's going to sing and we're so excited. Um, he's going to sing Walk With Me and uh, Lenny K is going to join us on another song. Very cool. Friend of mine and actually a really good supporter. Uh, he's been a big supporter of mine for a while now. Um, dear friend, he used to know my sister also. So it's kind of generational. Um, Tom Clark and the High Action Boys are going to be on that. And I don't know if you know Tom, but you should know him. He's uh, he's from Ohio initially, and he he's an amazing songwriter, a great musician and a great performer. Um, and he 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 lives in New York, so he'll be on that show. Um, 
you know, he plays a lot with Kevin Kinney. Mm-hmm. Do you know Kevin Kinney? Yep. Yeah. And, 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 and I think he's done shows with Peter Bach and Kevin Kinney uh, recently. So he's, he's a cool musician. Anyway, we're doing that. The record comes out on the 15th. Um, my vinyl should be showing up on the 7th. I'm so excited. I actually have vinyl for the record. Um, I got the CDs in the other day, so that's exciting. And then I'm just, um, going to try to figure out, you know, the touring for, for the fall, which after that, I think is really important for the record. I want to go out. I want to sell some merch. I'm going to get some t-shirts made and I just want to be on the road until the end of the year. And, and I'm going to um, release another song after walk with me, but I'm giving walk with me a long time because I really, really believe that this song is a meaningful song and I'm so proud of it. And I'm so, I love the fact that I'm, that Alejandro sings with me on it. it. It's the most meaningful thing that has happened to me in like 25 years, I think of my life, like it's really meaningful. So um, I'm going to stick with the single. And then in September, I, I'd like to maybe release Lace Up Your Sneakers, which is a song that an artist by the name of James Maddock helped me do. He's a real cool guitar player. He comes more from that Water Boys camp. He comes from Leicester, uh, England, but he lives in Brooklyn. And he's got like this real Rod Stewart kind of deep voice. Um, he's super cool. And um, he his, his voice is on the song, but it's only in the background, but he, he plays some guitar on it. And I'll, I'll release that in September. And then if I get to it, I would love to release a a third single called Shimmy. Um, Maybe I'll give that to Underground Garage early. It's just kind of a blues rock and roll track that's real fun. Um, It was influenced by a friend of mine who lives in a place called Seaside, Oregon. And um, her and I used to be like these crazy girls that used to get on the back of guys' motorcycles in New York City. And we used to like get ourselves into all sorts of trouble. And I, it's kind of like a, a, a homage to her in a way, you know, shimmy in the back seat, cruising down to, uh, cruising through seaside, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah. All right, so record release on the 30th of the month and then the album out in September. Uh, Alejandro, what do you got, anything going on for you? In terms a of lot. <laughs> what uh, you have a new record in the works? Uh, I completed a record in Italy. I went back and recorded 18 songs. Uh, they're all uh, songs from my past. I even did a Nun song. I did a uh, True Believers song. I did a Buick McCain song. Um, and then I did a different, but we did them electronically. Uh, that record is called Echo Dancing, uh, and it'll be out on Yep Rock in February. I think February 15th, I believe, is the release date, something like that. And I'm working on finishing up a memoir that I'm writing. I just returned from Calgary, Alberta, where I'm working with a theater group there on a one-man performance that I want to do. It's based around the memoir, and uh, that'll probably be ready in about a year or so you know amazing and and i'm touring you know all the time but not coming to st louis no sir (laughs) (laughs) he's coming to new york though (laughs) Uh, um well god sorry oh no go ahead diane yeah i just you know i know that we're coming to an end here and i just wanted to say um Thank you to Alejandro, of course, and thank you for having us on. But I, I, I did want to just give a plug to um, our friend Alejandro and I, who are who are really good friends uh, with Jesse Mallon, who um, you know is ill. And I just want to tell anybody that his sweet relief is still up, and it's going to be up for a while because he really does need the money. And so, if anybody wants to donate. Um, you know, it's the Jesse Mellon Fund through Sweet Relief, and we love him, and he's an amazing artist, and uh, he's gonna, he's he's working on getting better, and so just putting out that you little know, for Jesse. Je- Jesse is the reason that we know each other, Diane and I, and Jesse has not only, I mean, I think we're a good example of the type of people that uh, are attracted to Jesse, and the generosity and love that he has for rock and roll 
and the people around him who practice rock and roll. Uh, he's one of the coolest people I've ever met. And, uh, you know, I've been around for a long, long time. I've met a lot of people. And uh, he's, he's, he's really a super, super cool person. And so any sort of, you know, support that you can give Jesse, even in the way of a, just, you know, hope you feel better kind of thing or whatever it is, is positive, you know. So I encourage you to do it, you know. A truly unique artist that Jesse Mallon is. Uh, Diane Alejandro, thank you so much for being on The Lowdown. We've, it's been a real treat having you both. And uh, uh, I wish you both the, the best of luck on, on everything you have going on. Well, thank you. Yeah.